Julia for having me here. So I, I hope I will contribute something for uh, this uh, session. So um, my name is Osama Gad. I'm, I'm, as Sena said, I'm a visiting fellow uh, of the British Academy at the Institute of Classical Studies here. Uh, and I'm based in Cairo University, in Hatayn Shams University, which is, you know, uh, if you are not familiar with the university, Egyptian universities, we have a, a Cairo uh, University, Ain Shams University, and Alexandria University, which is a central university, universities in Egypt. So, um, so uh, my talk is about eurocentrism in print and digital technology. This is something that I've been developing uh, over the past uh, uh, years. And I will talk about uh, the troubled archive and the narrative of knowledge and power, uh, as I, I say. So, um, I will be reading, you know, because, you know, I, I don't think that my English is not very, you know, articulated. So, during the 18th and 19th centuries, the founders of papyrology built a massive archive of Egyptian papyri to support their research and teaching with original artifacts. The dispersed collection of these papyri is, to me, as an Egyptian scholar of Greek Roman, uh, Greek Roman Egypt, a troubled archive with a complex legacy of imperialism and colonialism. Theoretically and practically, the epistemological dilemma of papyrology is too clear to be ignored. The case of Egypt and Egyptians in this regard is extremely illuminating and telling. While the body of knowledge in this discipline was, and to a larger degree still is, produced by Western individuals and institutions of higher education and culture, its archive is an Egyptian archive of historical documents. National societies on both sides of the globe become recently extremely critical of the contaminated body of knowledge produced in this field, of the injustices of imperialism, colonialism, nationalism, and of Eurocentric narrative of the human past. The result is a fierce struggle of financial resources um, and for existence, in which only individuals and institutions committed to public and global access to education and knowledge <coughs> will survive. Building upon my experience over the past two decades, you know, so since I began, you know, um, learning uh, in uh, this uh, university, at the leading Egyptian institution in this field, i.e., Ancient University in Cairo, and using print and digital specific uh, samples from this archive, I will seek to explore and to illustrate some of the papyrological scholarly injustices visible also in archaeology and modern academia, such as Eurocentrism. Um, marginalization of underrepresented scholars and scholarship um, invisibility. So I will not uh, deal with all this, I will just concentrate with one point which is <coughs> Um What is while it, was many, uh, it has many connotations, I will start by choosing the simplest definition uh, of Eurocentrism. It is, at least to me, the historical narrative and social phenomenon that justified 200 years of European dominance over Egypt's space, time, and objects. There are a lot of definitions, of course, to the social, cultural, economic, political phenomena, but I have not concerned myself with a comprehensive revision of the literature on this regard. Since October and November 2015, I have been trying not to define but to dissect Eurocentrism in papyrology in order to figure out how we could get rid of it. But since that time, other symptoms have been discovered and reported, confirming that we are dealing with a chronic disease. The recent case of illicit trade, selling and trafficking of papyri and artifacts to the Museum of the Bible in Washington DC, to name just one example, is at least to me an alarm that we have to be careful in treating this issue. There is always something lurking in the darkness. Some of my European and American colleagues think that papyrology as practiced in the US and Europe is problem free. They think that papyri in European collection, museum, and art marks belong not to Egypt, but to Europe, and it is assumed that they are well cared for. Egypt, the backyard of Europe, is to them a source land of cultural raw materials, but never a source, of, uh, source land of scholarly import or products. The raw, material, the raw materials 
where and continue to be shipped to European and Western academic institutions to be processed by experts who maintained a monopoly on the process of knowledge production about everything Egyptian, I mean, linguistically. In the purology, at least, you have to publish either in English, German, French, and Italian, not in Arabic. In those manufacturing processes, the product was true to Western standards to the extent that nobody in Europe paused for a moment to think about the origins of these artifacts, to ask where these raw materials came from and what the causes of their externalities were. Egyptians, however, have never stopped asking these difficult questions. As I said in my Eidolon piece, what follows, you know, if you are familiar with Eidolon, you know, Donald Zuckerberg, what follows is an attempt to uh, contextualize a series of incidents in the wider matrix of Euros and Trism and Pivology. It's easy to point the finger at a specific person or an institution. It's harder to offer critical analysis that starts at the rim, but never stop unless it reaches the epic center. The solution I offer at the end uh, is not a carte blanche for anyone, including myself, but an expression of a personal commitment to theoretical and practical search for a solution to the current dilemma. So, first some facts. There is no antiquities market in Egypt. Rather, trade, sale, or commerce in antiquities, including all antiquities held as private property, is prohibited, according to the Egyptian law of antiquities, of course. Egypt is a source land of antiquities and will continue to be. Egyptian papyri and manuscripts are one of the main cultural objects at risk. The European Western market requires a continuous flow of original artifacts. The antiquities trade encompasses a global bi-directional network of interests. European experience in antiquities is not transcendent. It is one of the main historical products of Imperial Europe. Its coloniality is undeniable. Egyptians came to, or more precisely, have been allowed to enter the field, I mean classics, archaeology, papyrology, in fact very late, when rules and standards were already fixed and the classical tradition established. The Western canon is authoritative. Working in international archaeological projects in Egypt and research centers exercise a great deal of authority and power. The legal rights they possess on archaeological sites and the topoi they studied, the topics, are not simple as one thinks. Decolonization is both financially and morally costly, at least for Egypt and the Egyptians. 200 years of colonization and externalities cannot be undone in a few years. Keeping these facts in mind, let's now turn to diagnosing the current situation not to find an easy cure, but to understand the complexities of the present moment, how it is historically rooted in the past 200 years, and how the choices we made today will shape our global tomorrow. So, national and international patriarchy. Papyrology, as you all know, is a subfield of classics. Its main subject of study is Egyptian manuscripts, called papyri. By virtue of this definition, almost every single fragment of a text that is of interest to papyrologists, whether biblical or classical, was found in colonized Egypt. Western scholars in Imperial Europe have worked hard over the past century to fulfill the prophecy of German Nobel laureate and Roman historian Theodor Mommsen. Earning the Nobel, uh, the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1902 for his monumental book, Romische Geschichte, History of Rome, Mommsen is quoted as saying that just as the 19th century had been the century of epigraphy, inscriptions, so the 20th, uh, the 20th uh, would be the century of papyrology. Papyrology then is seen as a European academic doctrine with a noble German origin. It's a culturally and socially constructed field of study. It deals with made-in-Europe knowledge, an Eurocentric and institutionalized expertise about Greek texts inscribed on Egyptian papyri. The texts constructed as ancient and classical are the main focus in this field, but the objects they carry those texts are considered marginal and peripheral, even as collecting them is an imperial and colonial enterprise. And so, 
The current makeup of maiden neuropapyrology, whether it wanted or not, contributed to the present epistemological dilemma. Yes, direct and indirect participation in illicit trade and sale of unprovenanced papyri is condemned by American and European learned societies uh, of papyrology, yet a critical and complex question remains unanswered. To whom do papyri belong? To Europeans, to Americans, or to the Egyptians? The Egyptian Association of Papyrologists, inaugurated by Magdi Ismail recently, is clear in saying that artifacts from Egypt belong to Egypt and refuses to grant any kind of tolerance to international scholars working in papyrology. The American and European position on Egyptian scholars must be discovered indirectly. For a typical Western European answer, look no, ver no further than the Latin motto of the International Society of Papyrologists, the so-called Amicitia Papyrologorum. This is a motto that dates from the dark ages of interwar Europe, when the falcon could not hear the falconer, the cinder could not hold, and the ceremony of innocence was drowned, as William Butler Yeats described the horrific situation after World War I. Amicitia Papyrologorum, or the friendship of petrologists, has been in place since 1933. It's an academic professional one. Its meaning is assumed, but rarely defined, and remains so, uh, so up to the present moment. But in practice, it seems this friendship is for Europeans only. On the American level, the American Society of Papyrologists acknowledged that. Oh, sorry. I'm <laughs> okay, I will try to wrap up. Indirect participation is a complicated matter with varying degrees of complicity. It therefore leaves the determination of appropriate behavior to the prudential judgment of its individual member. There is no doubt that the prudential judgment of our American colleague, um, Andrew Kona of Monash University, who appended a third discussion of the provenance of the piece he published in, part, uh, in PASP is fundamental, which is a journal of the American Society of Papyrologists, is different than the prudential judgment of uh, another American papyrologist who has uh, published an unprovenanced uh, un fragment of papyri. So, um, I will to wrap up here um, and we'll try to go on uh, in just three minutes. So, uh, what I'm trying to say that there there is scholarship invisibility here. This is the, the who is who in papyrology and this is um, an Egyptian scholar uh, who uh, only one, only one person uh, who has appeared in this uh, papyrological uh, encyclopedia among many uh, Western. Um, but I think also the, the digital age could give us a lot of um, opportunity to work on uh, this material without any linguistic fire here, German, French, Italian, Spanish, and Arabic, which I have added in this dictionary, which is now in, in Leipzig. And I think also Arabic um, um, translation of the classics, this is a constitution of uh, uh, Athenians by Aristotle, translated by Taha Hussein himself. And this is a translation alignment I have done also between the Greek and uh, Arabic and, uh, um, and, and, and English. And this is Herodotus also. I mean, I, I can't go this because of the time. And this is also another uh, translation alignment. Um, but uh, the things that um, um, we, at least to me, we have to work on um, overcoming the, the past, the mistakes of the past, at least in constructing a certain type of knowledge about Egypt in papyrology and um, uh, the need for a proper dialogue between academic and uh, non-academic stakeholders in Egypt, the museum curators, uh, we, we, we should be doing this more and more in cultural heritage and um, I think, you know, without a proper academic dialogue uh, and converse, uh, conservation between the Egyptians and uh, non-Egyptians and Western scholars uh, representing this uh, heritage of Europe and American uh, papyrology and classics and ecology, I think there will be no future, at least to papyrology in Egypt because a lot of mistrust which has been 
uh, done uh, and constructed in the past two centuries. And with this, I will end my presentation. Thank you very much.